Now, The Hunt Palmer Show. Yes! I feel like I've been waiting for this my entire life. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Jolly good fun. Jolly, jolly good. Locking down the middle of the day. America's favorite daytime fun show. Live from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge studio, this is Hunt Palmer. Hour two, Monday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show, 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Hope your work week's off to a good start. Thanks for hanging out with us here on ESPN Baton Rouge. Denton Day in 30 minutes, talking about the uh, national college football landscape, and I'm sure we'll talk Washington Commanders as well. Hail Mary lands in our nation's capital. Jaden Daniels got that team playing really well and stole one yesterday from the Chicago Bears. We'll talk uh, about all that with Denton coming up at the bottom of the hour. This is the part of the week where we always talk about Southeastern Conference and what was happening over on Saturday. Look at my picks against the number that I gave you each and every Friday. Beck, I got a text from you midday. You did. Said things weren't going so hot. They weren't. You were 0-2. 0-2. Oklahoma and Ole Miss. I had Ole Miss lay in 20. They couldn't score and didn't do a very good job there, but thankfully Oklahoma didn't score either. Ole Miss had a chance to cover late. Didn't get it done. Then I had Mississippi State plus six. They almost covered. Yeah, yeah, no. No, they did not almost cover. They got absolutely creamed. Uh, Just about gave up 60 points to Arkansas in Starkville. Um, I listened to a Mississippi State postgame show that Robbie Falk did yesterday on the way back from uh, from uh, where we did the pre- and postgame show, and it's uh, it's bleak in Starkville at the moment. They were feeling a little bit better because they were playing a little bit better. Yeah. They were still losing every week, and then you just get smoked in a game at that home. you feel like you might be able to win. Like This is not the same as playing George. It's not the same no, as playing Texas. No. Like You feel like, okay, maybe there's a shot against Arkansas, and then you just can't get a stop. That's, uh, yeah. that's tough. So I was 0-2, but... After lunch, we hit the stride. We had Bama we in 17. After going back and forth on that one, back and forth, you hated the fact that I went back and made I that did, pick. Hunt, but you know what? I was I was absolutely just completely misjudging there, and That's you, right. you you got it you got 100 correct. Nailed it. Got Bama minus 17. Uh, took Vanderbilt plus 18 and a half. They easily got easy. there uh, against Texas. Almost won that game. And then Auburn and Kentucky. I kind of been riding Auburn a lot lately. They hadn't been really paying me back on it, but they did. They finally uh, they their, returned the favor. Got their first win. Uh, they finally gave the ball to Jarquez Hunter, which we'll talk yeah, about he's in a pretty second. good. So. And uh, he's ran for a billion yards, and they beat Kentucky pretty badly. And it feels like. I don't know. Uh, let's start with okay, let's start with Auburn and Kentucky. I wasn't planning on that, but I, I just have a kind of a train of thought that I want to run with there. Like, does it matter to Kentucky fans that Mark Stoops took the A and M job and now he's back at their it probably and, and then he's not winning? I mean, I can't they had one they one good week this year. I can't see a way that it doesn't affect his long term longevity at Kentucky. I mean, that has to be factored into it. It's just like, it's just one of those deals that I just don't think you can ever regain the trust unless you just start winning like crazy. Yeah. And let's be honest, like nice effort in Vaught Hemingway a few weeks ago, but you got annihilated at Florida. You got annihilated by South Carolina. You got annihilated by Auburn. Like these are not even the, the cream of the crop in the lost league we're talking about. I mean, they played Georgia tough, but they lost to Vandy in a game that they were, they were out physical in. Like it just... Not very good. <laughs> no. Nope. So um, I just feel like it's a weird time there. Um, but yeah, Hugh Freeze, who apparently did not travel with the team, he was sick, so he had to fly on a different plane. Um, but I guess if he, you know, got the game plan put in, it was hey, give the ball to Jarquez Hunter, which they have not done a lot of this year. They did way more of in that game, and he runs for over two bills, and uh, and he gets them home with an easy win there. So that was um, that was. I thought we would see more of that from Auburn throughout the season, quite frankly, and they've just been bad. And the turnovers got them early, and then there were just some bad play. Defense was better in this game against Kentucky, and they beat them uh, 24 to 10. Um, let's talk about uh, Missouri and Alabama because I don't believe that the scoreboard adequately reflects what this game looked like. I watched almost all of it inside the sports book we were at on Saturday, and. It looks like Alabama just completely controlled the action from start to finish, did whatever they wanted. 34 to nothing. Okay, yeah, the defense did. Now, Brady Cook went out of this game. He just couldn't play. And they brought in Drew Pine, who is one of the worst quarterbacks I've ever watched in an SEC game. He threw three interceptions. He was 6 of 12 for 42 yards, and they had no chance to do anything. That said, 
Like, Bama's offense was a little bit clunky in this game. Jalen Milrow was just missing wide open dudes. And we're going to spend a ton of time talking about Jalen Milrow next week in front of LSU and Alabama. But this week, man, like, it just... His box score is not that bad. 16 of 26 for 215, no touchdowns, no picks, and he ran it 11 times for 50 yards and a score. Like, that all looks like pretty solid play, but it's just the, the optics of it. He had guys running open against this Missouri secondary, and he couldn't hit them. It, and it was not like, oh, there was one bad throw. I'm sitting next to Brandon Taylor, and we keep and we just keep tapping each other on the elbow on the air. Like, he can't hit anybody, and it's just he, he hasn't seemed to evolve as a passer. The question was, is Kalen DeBoer going to unlock something in him the same way he did with Michael Penix at, at, at Washington? And the answer to this point has been no. Like, Milrow's still a freak athlete running it. He still hits some deep balls from time to time. But, like, his play from the pocket... Inconsistent, I just, think. Yeah, is just generally not that great. Like, it's not that he can't make throws because he does get a clean pocket a lot. He does have a big arm. And, like, every once in a while, he hits, like, two or three in a row. And you're like, okay, that's that that looks really good. And then there's, a, you know, a 12-yard out route, and the ball goes flying over the bench. And you're just like, what? There's a guy that's running, like, a square in 15 yards down the field, and the ball skips to him. And it's, like, not even close. Um, and that's I saw a ton of that in the game. And that doesn't really matter because Missouri threw for 72 yards in the game. But it just... To me, nice win by Alabama. You'll take any win you can get at this point, especially an easy one considering you've been in dogfights with South Carolina and and you know teams like that, but it just it didn't look 34 to nothing to my eye. If you had taken the score bug down, I would have said, "Yeah, it's not a not a great effort by Alabama." So, we'll talk about it more next week, but not uh not the cleanest 34 to nothing I've ever seen. Vanderbilt continues to acquit itself incredibly nicely like it was a good story that they popped up one day and beat Alabama but the fact of the matter is that they're now showing up every single week and playing a good football game and you can talk about whatever you want with Ball State that wasn't great but like they went up there and physically whipped Kentucky they beat Alabama they played a tough game against Missouri they could have won that went into overtime um, and they beat Virginia Tech, and now they play Texas, who should have been kind of ticked off and had half the stadium in Burn Orange in Nashville, and you look up, and it's a 27-24 to game. Um, Pavia makes that first play to run for the touchdown down the right sideline, and um, you, know, you kind of think, God, this guy's going to do this again. Um, but Vanderbilt had a tough time slowing Texas down. They got the two turnovers, but they didn't, they didn't do a great job of, like, of limiting the Texas offense. And it was left on Vanderbilt's offense to continue to respond. And I thought they did. Pavia, again, 16 carries. And he's getting banged up. And back, we talked about this before we even knew Vanderbilt was any good when they played Virginia Tech. And I was like, he ran it 20 times in this game. Like, he's not going to be able to do that every single week. And I, we'll see by the time they get to Baton Rouge. But it just it feels like it, this is going to take its toll on him. Yeah, it probably will, man. I mean, he he clearly uh, had problems in this game. He, he managed to come back and, and fought hard and... That last touchdown throw was just ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't understand. I still don't know how that ball got through and, and, was, and they were able to catch it. But uh, to me, man, the, 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 the fight that they showed was really impressive. I mean, that they, they couldn't really do much besides that first drive when they scored in the first half. Other than that, the offense was doing nothing. It was 21-7. They got a field goal at the end of the first half to make it 21-10. But... Uh, you you could have you could have written that game off and thought okay well this is when they quit this is when they this is when Vanderbilt is shows shows themselves to be Vanderbilt but they didn't and they fought hard and they they got back into the game and had a chance to get an onside kick to to maybe tie it or, or win it and so I, I just I really can continue to be impressed by Vanderbilt I don't know how you can't be no I mean, they this is my read on Vanderbilt and we wouldn't we probably wouldn't honestly spend this much time on Vanderbilt if uh, if LSU wasn't playing them coming up but um, my read on Vanderbilt right now is they're solid 1-22. to 22. Like, they have solid football players, and they're well-coached. But the belief that he personally puts into the rest of the guys on that sideline is, is so powerful because he's making plays that are, are not only winning football plays, but they're exciting football plays that jolt the entire team. When you're running around and, and making plays like that and then, and then taking chances with your arm, like, 
it's it, there's just a belief that I think he personally is responsible for that's that's incredibly powerful for that entire uh, entire Vanderbilt team. So that was my thought uh, on the doors. Wrapping things up here in SEC play, we'll hit on Oklahoma and Ole Miss. Um, Oklahoma is just completely feckless on offense. They just can't do anything. And Jackson Arnold went out there and led a couple of touchdown drives in the first half, and they were leading at halftime. And then you come out in the second half and you just throw up a bagel. I mean, just no threat of getting anything done um, on the ground. I thought Jackson Dart was really, really good in this game, considering that Ole Miss could not run the ball on Oklahoma's defense. Ole Miss finished the game with uh, with 69 yards on 31 carries. And they basically said, all right, Jackson, you've got to got to make that happen because we can't run the ball. And he he took care of it. He was productive enough, made the big touchdown pass to Priest Corn. Um, and I thought did a good job uh, in the game. So I was pulling for Oklahoma to win it. Obviously, I'd, I'd like for, to, for Ole Miss to get that third loss, but that probably comes uh, when Georgia comes to town in two weeks. So we'll see. Yeah, Oklahoma had 16 yards in their first four possessions in the second half. Yeah, I mean, they just can't. They, 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 they couldn't move the ball. The first half, I was watching the first half of that game, and, and that uh, first, you know, the first, first, uh, first time they had the ball, they got down into the red zone on, on the two-yard line and couldn't score. Uh, but that was a solid drive, and then they score, you know, sixty yard drive on the second second drive. And you think maybe Jackson Arnold has has uh, put some injected some confidence and some uh, ability to this offense actually move the ball, and then it just it, they return back to what we've seen from them the last three weeks uh, in the second half. So yeah, man, it's it's maybe some different looks from a new offensive coordinator yeah, that Ole Miss so, wasn't yeah. ready for, and then finally that they Adjusted turned into a it. pumpkin there. But I, and then lastly, you mentioned it, but I'll just toss these stats out there because they're absurd. Um, Arkansas in the game at. Um, at Mississippi State, 314 passing yards, 359 rushing yards, and on top of that, let me I'll, I'll reiterate, 314 passing yards, 359 rushing yards, and 0 for 7 on third down. <laughs> 0 for 7 on third down, they score 58 points. I try not to speak in absolutes, and I certainly can't in this instance, but that has to be the most points ever scored in a college football game without converting a third down. Well, I don't know because I wonder if there's been games where teams never even got to third down mean, and score just kept scoring. So I don't without know. Maybe a not. single conversion. Though. They, they, they had to probably at least get one at some point. At some point. Yeah. 0 of 7 on third down with 700 yards of offense. That is crazy that Arkansas pulled that off, and it's tough times for uh, for Jeff Levy. Uh, let's put an over-under back. Mississippi State is 1-7. They have now lost seven games in a row, and they will host UMass at 315 coming up on Saturday. The over-under for attendance in that game, I think Davis Wade sits somewhere in the neighborhood of 65,000. They had, they, and Davis Wade, they had uh, 49,000 in it the wasn't, Arkansas and it game. Wasn't and it wasn't 49,000. So, so over under for actual attendance at the start of the second quarter, twenty one thousand. Oh, under, under twenty. I remember. 000. I remember there was a Texas A and M game a couple of years ago. Maybe it was COVID. I don't remember what year it was, but there was a Texas A and M game where they were playing somebody like that at the end of the year. And I, they were a picture of people were posting pictures of the stadium, and there was like maybe a couple thousand people in there. I mean, it, it's was it just, the end of the Jimbo era? Yeah, I think it was okay. maybe, that's, and, it, and it was a non-conference when game. When the coach loses the fan base, that's it's, a tough scene. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know that Jeff Levy's lost the fan base, but they're not excited for UMass. Cause UMass no. is one of the worst teams in the country. Yeah, and you're just not going to get anybody to show up for that. <laughs> like it's just you're just not. So uh, that's a look around the Southeastern Conference. Uh, Pro Football Focus grades the LSU players every single week. I know that some people think that that's really interesting stuff. I know that some people think it's completely stupid. Uh, it doesn't matter what camp you're in. But I will say this. I write a piece for LouisianaSports.net every single week about the pro football rankings. And, and most of the time, whatever you thought watching the game is reflected in those grades. I, I think that it, it, it's pretty accurate based on, on that. Um, and I thought that the illustration that pro football focus had of LSU's game on Saturday in College Station was pretty much to a T what we watched. So I'll get into some of that and paint that picture for you when we come back. The Hunt Palmer Show. The Highland Insurance Group, highlandig.com is the website. If you're a business owner and I'd say EPL insurance, do you know what that is? If I say cyber insurance, you know what that covers? If I ask about your DNO policy, do you know what that is? If you do, that's awesome. If you're a business owner and you don't, 
I would strongly suggest you get to figuring that out. And to do so, contact the Highland Insurance Group. You need to have an insurance broker on your team that you can trust, that can make sure that your business is put in a proper position in terms of your insurance program. And the Highland Insurance Group can do that. Jonathan Carbo and his team constantly are talking to me about how you ought to trust your insurance broker like you trust your attorney. When things go badly and you maybe don't know exactly what's going on on that side of things, you trust your attorney to make things happen and do the right thing, to represent you. That's what an insurance broker does in the marketplace and in a claim situation. They make sure that you're paying the proper amount of premium for the coverage that you need. They make sure that coverage is in place and that pay that claim is paid in the event that something bad happens. The time to look at your insurance program is not after the claim. It's right now in front of the claim. And the Highland Insurance Group can make that happen for you. Check them out online, highlandig.com. It's the Highland Insurance Group right here in Baton Rouge, highlandig.com. This is the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Gulf Coast Office Products. We'll get to Denton Day here in 10 minutes talking about the uh, national college football scene. Always enjoy our conversations with Denton, so we'll chat with him coming up here shortly. Uh, Pro Football Focus grades came up uh, yesterday. I wrote a piece on it at louisianasports.net, and I thought they really accurately illustrated uh, just what we saw on the field on on Saturday. LSU's grades were really, really poor. Um, I'll do this piece every single week, and and a lot of times um, the high grades are are in the high 70s and, and creeping into the 80s at times. Um, the low grades generally hover in, in the 60s. And the lowest five grades here were all under 55, and a couple of them were, were glaring. And you look at the lowest graded player on LSU's team for the game on Saturday, and it's Whit Weeks, who'd been playing an All-American level for the last couple of weeks. He had 18 tackles against Ole Miss. He made impactful play after impactful play against Arkansas, and he grades out at 42.9. In this game, he was a 36.7 against the run and a 33 in tackling. Weeks had five total tackles and they credited him with three missed tackles. And then you look at Greg Penn at linebacker. He was the third lowest graded player on LSU's entire team at 53.9. And that was propped up by some pass rush snaps. His run grade, Weeks was 36.7. He was 37.6. So a point that... Put, I mean, those, that's your two linebackers. And it's not surprising, considering the Texas A&M ran it all over LSU in the entire second half, but that is just not something I saw coming. You know, when when I sit here, I try to take some pride in in analyzing the sports that we talk about here and try to, to sound educated um, and give y'all some sound information and some reasonable opinions. And whenever I say something and it, it proves to be completely opposite, you know, I want to own up to that and and talk about why. And I just, I, I, I could not have envisioned Whit Weeks and Greg Penn looking completely lost in the second half. I My bad on that. But it certainly did happen. I think another huge piece to this is on the offensive side of LSU's team, the five lowest graded players on the team on offense were offensive linemen. Will Campbell was the second lowest graded player on LSU's roster on Saturday, 49.3. In the pass blocking game, he was a 58.1. And in the run blocking game, a 48. And it showed there was some pressure on Garrett Nussmeyer. LSU couldn't run the ball. Paul Mabango was put in when Garrett Dellinger went down, 53.9. DJ Chester, 55. Emory Jones, 56. Miles Frazier, 59. All of your offensive linemen across the board, including one sub, so six total, were under 60 grades in this game. And that's part of the reason you can't get a push offensively and run the ball. You've just got guys who aren't capable of more often than not, of getting a push against high-level defensive linemen. And I thought in watching the game, now y'all know I'm not doing these grades and I couldn't even tell you how they come up with the grades. 
But in watching the game and understanding how good Texas A&M's defensive front is, I thought LSU did a great job of pass protection in the first half. You'd scored 17 points. Nussmeyer hadn't been sacked. I thought you did a pretty good job. And Mike Elko told the sideline reporter, like, we got to affect him more on third down. We're just not affecting him on third downs. And that's Mike Elko's baby. He wants to get creative and bring pressure from different places, and he wants to to show pressure and drop at times and bring surprise pressure. And none of that was getting home to Garrett Nussmeyer. No, she was moving the ball. I mean, when you when you have 17 points scored and you've already missed two field goals, like you're 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 getting into scoring position. And LSU was doing that, but when the time came to try to run it in the second half and then to protect Nussmeyer when you got behind these grades reared their ugly heads. When you look at the highest grades on LSU's team, you got JVR Suggs, who did a good job in pass rushing, got skinny and got into the hole. He graded an, an 88 because of his pass rushing grades that were were so good. Um, he had 21 snaps played. He rushed the passer five times, and in those five pass rushes, he had a sack and two other hurries. So three out of five pass rushes, he affected the quarterback. That's pretty good. But beyond that, you're looking at Ashton Stamps and Zy Alexander, who both graded in the low 70s. And it didn't matter because AM didn't throw the ball. Marcel Reed had two attempts. So you're not doing a lot if your corners are grading out well. Aaron Anderson graded a 70. Of course, he made the big play on the slant catch and run for a big touchdown for LSU. Um, and I think he's having a fantastic year. And he showed up in these rankings a couple times. Good to see his home run hitting ability there on that catch and run. And then Gio Piaz was the third highest rated player on the team, 71.5. Um, but really a lot of that was on the pass rush where he graded 79.4. And again, Texas A&M didn't pass very much. LSU's pass rush is really good when Wigman's out there. And if Wigman finishes that game, LSU wins it comfortably by a couple of scores and it's a different conversation. But he didn't. And LSU needed to stop the run. And Piaz, whose grade was good for the day at 71.5, was only 60.9 against the run, which is, you know, mediocre. It's not terrible, but it is mediocre. And so I think that these grades accurately reflect what we saw. LSU's biggest issues were at linebacker and the offensive line. Those showed up. LSU's best performances were in a couple of pass rush situations. And then the corners, who never had to play. So... If you want to see all these grades and kind of my uh, explanation of, of how they shook out, you can head over to louisianasports.net. It's uh, titled PFF Grades Reflective Poor Showing for LSU at Texas A&M. Or you can follow me on Twitter at HuntPalmer88 and everything that I write up for louisianasports.net will uh, will be sent your way uh, being Twitter eventually. So uh, that's a look at Pro Football Focus's grades for LSU at Texas A&M. Bad, bad stuff for the Tigers back on Saturday. Let's talk some National College football and a little Washington Commanders. Jaden Daniels, Hail Mary with Denton Day from SiriusXM's College Football Overtime. That is coming up next. The Hunt Palmer Show. Genesis of Baton Rouge.com. Genesis of Baton Rouge.com. If you don't love the car buying experience, try Genesis of Baton Rouge. It's a different experience. You're going to stop by their dealership, first class facility. They're going to make you comfortable. They're going to make you feel like a guest. Not a, not a customer. It's going to be a pressure-free, hassle-free sales experience with one of their brand ambassadors who are happy to walk you through the entire line, get you into a test drive. And if one of the things you don't like about the car buying experience is the in-dealership experience, you don't have to have that. You know, it's great at Genesis of Baton Rouge. You can start your process at genesisofbatonrouge.com. You can do a test drive remotely, have one of their brand ambassadors drive a vehicle to you and help you with that test drive. And if you want... You can do e-contracts, digital delivery, and you never set foot on the dealership once. It's so easy. It's the experience of driving a Genesis of Baton Rouge. With that new Genesis, you're going to get a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty. It's as good as you're going to find in the industry. You're going to get three years of complimentary valet maintenance, all part of driving a Genesis at Genesis of Baton Rouge. Their airline at Piku near Women's Hospital, it's... Genesis of Baton Rouge. Check them out online. Genesis of Baton Rouge.com. You're listening to the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Gulf Coast Office Products. Congratulations to Tyler Hunt from Baton Rouge. Tyler is the week nine winner in our 2024 college football pick'em contest and wins a Hooters wing party for 10 people. Don't forget to make your picks for round 10 by this Thursday at noon. 
Weekly winners will receive a Hooters Wing Party for 10, and the first place season long champion will receive a 75 inch 4K flat screen TV and soundbar, plus free Hooters Wings for an entire year. It's the 2024 College Football Pick 'em presented by Hooters. Tyler Hunt. You like to hear that. Congrats, Tyler. Enjoy the wings. Chat with our guy Denton Day, Sirius XM College Football Overtime. But we're not going to start with college football. We're going to start in the National Football League because Denton, we know it's a big Washington guy, and Jaden got it done one way or another yesterday with the Hail Mary against the Chicago Bears. What was your reaction real time, Denton? Uh, so, Hans, it's funny that you asked that because uh, guess who was stuck at a Sunday wedding yesterday ah! uh, during the game? So I was receiving texts from uh, my dad with updates. And then we go in to, to do a little bit of uh, uh, dinner, which the food was very nice, thankfully. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of signal, so I'm I'm getting bad texts like, oh, we're only at R35 with six seconds left, and I'm like, oh, God, this is not good. And then I get a notification that the team won. So I had to dip out of dinner. I called my dad, and I was like, I need a breakdown immediately. <laughs> and I've watched the play about a thousand times since, but it was, I mean, it was epic. Uh, there, there's very few guys in the NFL that can make the kind of throw that he made with the touch, the precision, getting the air under it. It was it was an impressive way to win, and then it was a cherry on the top that he was going up against a fan base in Chicago that had been very vocal that he is actually not that good and that Caleb Williams is the one that's better, and it was not so on Sunday. So it was a very good good afternoon. Yeah, statistically speaking, it was a much better day for Jaden than it was for uh, for Caleb Williams. But to Williams' credit, he did drive him down there and put that uh, go-ahead touchdown in, but wasn't enough. We left too much time for JD5. How are we feeling about the, the commander's chances as, as a threat in the NFC right now? Really, really good. I mean, really, really good. We're going to find out a lot in a couple of weeks. They got Philly on a Thursday in November. I believe the date's the 14th, so it's coming up in a couple of weeks. It looks like that's going to be uh, for maybe not the, the division yet, but it's going to be a step up uh, in that divisional race. You know, Philly's starting to put it together, but I like the chances with Jake back there. He is not uh, – he doesn't miss very often is what I have learned. He steps up in big moments, and I think the first Thursday night game is going to be nothing different in a couple of weeks. We shall see. It's been exciting for us to, to watch here in Baton Rouge. What was not exciting to watch for us here in Baton Rouge was LSU getting uh, whitewashed in the second half, 31-6, uh, to in a loss that was uh, 38-23 in College Station, kind of a tale of two halves once Marcel Reed came in. What was your, uh, what was your read, um, for lack of a better term, on LSU and Texas A&M on Saturday? I mean, Marcel Reed was the read. I mean, he was, he was so, so good when he came in, and I was, I was stunned that LSU had issues with – the read option the way that they did with Marcel Reed beating them with his legs on several different occasions and just not being able to define the ball carrier uh, in the second half. You know, I thought they would be a lot better at that. Um, so it was, it was impressive from the standpoint of Texas a and I mean, you had a quarterback come in to completely change the game despite the fact he only threw two passes. Um, if, if Texas A&M is smart, and I think, and I hope that Mike Elko is going to make this decision, like Reed has to be their guy moving forward. You cannot go back to Connor Wegman after that kind of a performance unless you do go uh, with Marcel Reed and he absolutely takes the number two in the bed, but he should be the guy moving forward. I think Texas A&M, it feels like they have a legit chance. Maybe not to beat Georgia, but it feels like they have a legit chance to get into the SEC championship game. So first year under new head coach and Mike Elko getting somewhere where Jimbo Fisher never got you, has to feel pretty good. Yeah, I don't know how the three-way would work out if Texas A&M, Texas, and uh, Georgia all have one loss. That would mean Texas beats Texas A&M, but I don't know how all that works round robin. So um, I, I'm, I, I, we'll see if that if that does play out. But I, I'm with you. I think Connor Wigman has started his last game at Texas A&M. I, I don't know that he'll even be there next year because he's now had three performances that have just been awful. And I just don't know how you come back from from that. And I think Reed's probably the guy there for the Aggies. Um, Oregon flexed its muscles against Illinois. They win 38-9. to nine. Do you think they're the best team in the country? Yeah, right now I do. And I think it kind of put an end to a, what was a fun side story in the Big Ten of like, ooh, what is this Illinois team? We have so many expectations for so many other teams, but yet this Illinois team is just beating Michigan and they only have one loss. And ooh, could they... Could they do something really silly at the college at the end of the college football season and maybe you know get it? No, the answer was no. They, they played a team that is very much in the weight class of a national championship contender, and they were very much not. It was like a freshman going up against a varsity athlete. It just it, it wasn't. They were not on the same level. So it was a fun story. But Oregon is absolutely as good as advertised, and they're showing it now on a regular basis. They had that little stretch in the beginning of the season, bumps in the road, felt like they were trying to figure themselves out a little bit. Now they know who they are, and they're a pretty damn good football team. 
Indiana rolls. They had game day in town, and they took care of their business uh, in that game against Washington, 31-17. to Really, you look at their schedule, and kind of at Ohio State, looks like the only real hiccup, but I'm not used to saying that with Indiana. Do you trust them to take care of the other three games outside of that one in Columbus? I do. There's something about Kurt Signetti where he is just a winner. Like it's, it's the most cliche thing, but he wins everywhere that he goes. And it's not just that they're beating some of the teams. Like if you look at their schedule now, Hunt, the, the teams that they played, it's not the most impressive juggernaut of lineups, but more so than not, they're, they're shellacking these teams. Like it wasn't even really all that close to the second half with Washington. And they're doing this with their backup quarterback. Yeah. So if you put their starting quarterback in that, that victory is, is likely more than the 14 points that it ended up being. So, you know, you're, you're only in charge of playing who's on your schedule. But if you're beating the teams the way that they're beating teams, I mean, that went against Nebraska two weeks ago. Like, this is a good football team. Do they, do they match up with Ohio State? We'll see when they actually get on the field with them. But at least right now, this does feel like a team that could get into the college football playoff and wouldn't get absolutely dusted if they got there. Well, let's just keep it with the Big Ten because you feel like Oregon's gonna gonna make it in, and you're telling me that you think Indiana is probably at worst a one loss team. Then you've still got Ohio State and undefeated Penn State as well. Is, it, is are those four gonna get in? Do you think? It, it does feel like as we sit here right now that it will be a four a four bit league, which is crazy to think. I thought I, I think at the beginning of the year I would have said the SEC is a four bit league, and maybe they still are. But I feel confident right now saying that I think. The, the Big Ten is going to get four. If you're, put, if you're setting their over-under, you're setting it to three and a half. And then you're saying, all right, which one of Penn State or Indiana is either going to, to get in or to, to fall short? But it does feel right now comfortably that you could say it's not crazy if they're getting four teams in if Indiana continues to think. Into the ACC, I realize it's a rivalry game, but it didn't have a lot of juice this year because Miami's a lot better. But I, I, I want to stick with Miami. They didn't didn't have a hiccup there. They're now 8-0, and and you look at what they've got remaining on their schedule. It's Duke. It's at Georgia Tech. It's Wake Forest. It's at Syracuse. I, it feels like they're, they're a lock to get in, no? So that's the big question. You know, I was, I was kind of like doing this on Friday night, and I was, you know, playing out scenarios in my head. I don't know if Miami can get in if they lose the ACC championship game because of what you like. Their schedule has stunk. Yeah, it's bad. And it's not their fault. Like, that's just kind of what the ACC is. But their schedule has absolutely been atrocious. So, when you, if they get to, let's just say Clemson, right? And Clemson, you know, beats Pitt and Clemson gets in and, and they, it's Clemson and Miami, the ACC championship, and Clemson wins. Unless they win on like the flukish of flukish plays. I don't know that Miami gets in with one loss when you look around the rest of the league and you have the potential like a Texas team that lost to Georgia but beat Texas A&M or a Texas A&M team that like beat LSU. Like Everyone in the SEC is going to have a quality win that Miami does not have. And most of the teams in the Big Ten, even if they have one loss, are going to have a quality win that Miami does not have. So I don't know if they get in if they lose the ACC championship. That's interesting. And I realize we just saw this last year with the ACC, but that was an injury to Jordan Travis more so than it was the disrespect of the league, I think. And if you're looking at a bunch of two-loss SEC teams, which Bama's got – the Bama LSU um, winner will have will have two losses if they can get out, out of the rest of their schedule. Um, you're looking at a Tennessee team that probably has two losses um, if they lose to, to Georgia. Um, you know – I, like it just feels like there's going to be a handful of LSH, of SEC two loss teams, and if if you're comparing them to Miami directly, I'm just curious how that works out. But you you seem to think that the SEC team would probably get the nod. Uh, if it's a two loss team, no. But if it's a one loss team, I think there can. Well, I guess it really depends. Like if it's Texas, I, I feel like if you're a two loss team and you have at least two big time wins, yeah. I think you might be able to get in over a, a one loss Miami team. Is it great? No, but. Look, the ACC is bad, and the SEC isn't. Like it, that, that really just is what it comes down to. Will people be upset about it? Certainly, but I mean, who would you rather see? Like if if it's Texas or if it's Georgia, God forbid, or a one loss Miami team because they played one good team, and that's the team they ended up losing to. Like I, I find it very difficult to say that I I think Miami would be better than that. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's fascinating. I think this is all healthy. Like I think this is great that we can have this discussion because this is not one that we needed to have. Uh, with a two team and a four team playoff, but now now that th- there's just more people that are interested at this point. So um, I'm curious uh, your thoughts on Ohio State headed to Happy Valley this Saturday. How do you think that one shakes out? 
I thought Ohio State escaped this weekend. Yeah. That was the biggest surprise of the weekend is that they didn't absolutely blow the doors off of Nebraska. And in fact, if Rayola was just a touch more accurate on three throws, Nebraska not only wins that game on, I think they win it by double digits. Like he had the opportunities and he just, you know, he's a young quarterback. He just wasn't able to capitalize on them. But I get the feeling that there's going to be a massive bounce back and that Penn State might be on the receiving end of a, a little bit of a taking behind a, a, of the woodshed. There's so much, there's just so much talent offensively. And I look at Penn State and Drew Aller, I won, we don't even know if he's going to play. I'm expecting him to play, but we don't know that for sure. Yeah. They just don't have the talent. They don't have an elite wide receiver. Warren is great as a tight end, but you've got to have a number one wide receiver if you want to hang with like an Ohio State. And I don't think Penn State has that. So I think Ohio State is going to, uh, this is going to be their biggest flexing of the muscles so far this year. I'm fascinated by this game. We're certainly going to talk about it as the week progresses. But uh, South Carolina annihilated Oklahoma two weeks ago. They're coming off of a bye. And Texas A&M goes to Columbia off the most emotional win early of the Mike Elko era. Is there any chance that South Carolina can up in Texas A&M in Columbia on Saturday? Yeah, that feels like a trap game, doesn't it? I mean, that that feels like a trap game. Some questions the quarterback. Do they go with Marcel Reed? You're coming off of this massive win. Uh, your program is riding the highest that has been probably since Johnny Manziel was there. Uh, this feels like the prototypical trap game, but if they can get through it, then you feel like they're sitting pretty good the rest of the way, knowing that they just got that Texas game at the end of the schedule. And then you got Pittsburgh and SMU. Um, we just talked about the S- ACC a lot, and you feel like it's a Miami Clemson discussion. Does this game matter? These two teams are unbeaten in league play, and Pitt's undefeated overall. Yeah, if Pitt, I mean, Pitt is the team that could really cause the chaos in the ACC. Because they got SMU. If they beat them, I mean, that's a really quality win for Pitt. And then on top of that, you get Clemson uh, in, in a matter of, I think it's two weeks after that, one week after that. So you're, Pitt has a really good opportunity to blow up what I hope is the ACC championship of Miami and Clemson because I want to see those two teams play. But, uh, I mean, the Pitt Panthers have been a lot of fun. they got a young quarterback. You know, we talk about quarterback play a lot. Uh, some of the quarterbacks across the nation aren't playing well. they got to do that is. So, I mean, if Pitt beats SMU, they're in that conversation certainly now, but the win against SMU really will help that out. Eli Holstein, he's from right here in South Louisiana, just outside of Baton Rouge, so we know him well. He's playing, uh, playing really well for the Pitt Panthers thus far. Denton, we appreciate some time. Have a great week, man. I appreciate it as always, man. Thank you. Denton Day, Sirius XM's college football overtime. Always enjoy our, uh, our Monday discussions with him. Our Monday show is brought to you by Gulf Coast Office Products. Be back and close things out next. The Hunt Palmer Show. Evolve Physical Therapy in Sports. EvolvePT.com is the website. It's great to, to walk around inside of Evolve. I've gotten to know Robbie Bolton real well, and we uh, walk around in there. They've got just incredible um, equipment in their first-class stuff that they use to get your rehabilitation process moving to get you back to being your active self. They can do the isokinetic testing, which tests your your recovery and how your muscles are responding and, and if that strength is coming back. And they're there to get rid of the pain. Pain sucks. And if you can't run or work out, can't play golf or pickleball or can't pick up your grandkids, if you're an active person, you got pain, and that's why you can't, can't do the things you want to do, go to Evolve Physical Therapy and Sports and let them help you. Maybe it's cupping. Maybe it's dry needling. Maybe it's scraping. They can do soft tissue manipulation. Don't go pay for a massage. Use your insurance and go to physical therapy. Evolve Physical Therapy and Sports. Robbie Bolton's been at this for two decades. Worked with some professional athletes. And he's happy. He and his team are happy to work with you. It's Evolve Physical Therapy and Sports. EvolvePT.com. EvolvePT.com. Evolve Physical Therapy and Sports. This is the Hunt Palmer Show. Brought to you by Gulf Coast Office Products. Closing it down here on a Monday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. We're brought to you by Gulf Coast Office Products. Visit them online, gcopnet.com. They're not one of the big, big box stores, but they've got the capabilities. They've got over a million dollars worth of inventory on site here in Baton Rouge and throughout the state. They can service your needs, printing, copying, scanning. They've also 
not a mom and pop shop, but they've got great customer service. Trey Buell is fantastic to work with. We work with them right here, I guarantee. They handle all of our printing, copying, scanning. If you don't have a great relationship with your rep, don't know what you may need from that perspective, Gulf Coast Office Products is happy to help you. Check them out online, gcopnet.com, Gulf Coast Office Products. Bring your Monday shows each and every week. All right, Beck, I guess there's only one thing left to do. That's uh, play, take it, or leave it. All righty, first one here. Golfer Tom Kim, had, he was in the news a little bit for the President's Cup. Well, he's uh, in the news again uh, for damaging a locker door after he lost in a playoff to fellow uh, countryman uh, Ben Ahn in the DP World Tour's Genesis Championship. He said he was sorry, uh, didn't intend to damage the door, but uh, he was frustrated. Take it or leave it. Um, I mean, you can't break a locker. That's just not not necessary. I, I realize that I don't. I, I run as cool as most people, uh, as, as than more people. Um, I, I don't. I don't run super hot and go nuts like that. But let's not let's not damage property. Well, uh, in the locker room, it's not even just that. It's also like how many times have we heard about guys doing this and they hurt themselves? Like he could have too. he could have easily like broken a finger or like yeah. sprained his wrist and he'll be out for three or four weeks maybe a month and he can't make any money like just don't do that it's so stupid don't right. hurt your I mean, don't, I'm don't assuming he probably won a ton of money yesterday yeah he's, he's <laughs> definitely still won a lot of money even though he lost in the playoff he still yeah. made probably I mean, I'm glad it matters to him and he yeah, wants to win yeah, that's yeah. all well and good don't but you don't, you don't need to do that no you don't all right next one here the emotional hedge take it or leave it I mean, I'll take it. I know what you're referencing here. I, I was, uh, I, I was disgusting. I was weak. I was pitiful. I was gross. Um, we All did our, things. we did our, uh, our pregame show from a casino, um, and yep. I, uh, I went to the window before the pregame show started and, and took the $100 that I had brought to play blackjack and put it on A&M because I just couldn't stand it. I had to yep. put them on the money line. I was happy to light that $100 on fire if meant LSU was going to go there and win, but I was going to collect the 83-33 uh, if, if LSU lost, and I did have to go to the window after the postgame show and sadly uh, sadly take in $83. It was a gross, weak, pitiful move by me, uh, but it had to be done because I just I, I was going to have to get something out of it. Yep, that's. Uh, I saw it. Saw I hated you sent it. the uh, yeah. You sent the picture. I was, of I was in my. And... I was in my full like pregame show gear. I got the LSU hat, and my LSU Radio Network shirt, and the woman that was taking my ticket was an LSU fan too. She had her LSU stuff on in the sports book, and I, I said Texas A and M on the money line. She looks. She was like, "Are you serious?" I was like, I, I, "It's an emotional hedge. I got to do it." So I'm not proud of it. It didn't but, work, by the way, Hunt. No, it didn't. But I, you know, I got the eighty three dollars. I didn't want you the eighty three dollars. I mean, you did. I guess. Uh, I guess there's maybe not really any sauce taken there. That, but no. you're $83 richer, hunt. Huh? Next one here, Connor Wegman will transfer this offseason. Take it or leave it. I'm going to take it. I, I think that ship's run its course. I, I don't know how you could watch him this year and suggest that that was going to be the answer for you moving forward, especially in the transfer portal era. You've got a quarterback behind him that's more dynamic and more athletic. Maybe he doesn't throw it uh, great, but Wigman doesn't throw it great either. And so um, I, I just I think he'll either uh, – I think he'll transfer and, and see if he can find, catch on at a different place. That, that was – he was the key. I mean, I talked about it all week last week, and I thought there was a pretty good chance that he would not play well at all. He played horribly, but it, it didn't last long enough for LSU. All right, last one here. The Yankees will tighten the World Series tonight with a win in the Bronx. I think I saw Shohei Otani is going to play, I, I believe, in Game yeah. 3. in this. Uh, so take it or leave it. Um, they got to win. I mean, they have to. I'll take it. I'll take um, it. I, I will. They're at home. I think they'll win. The Dodgers are really good. There have been two really close games. The uh, the Dodgers obviously went to walk off slam from Freddie, and then you see the the, the Yankees got it to to, to crunch time um, on uh, Saturday night. They weren't able to, to finish the deal. I think they'll win this one at home. I'm hoping they win this one at home because I don't really want to see a three to nothing World Series uh, at this point. So I've enjoyed the baseball. I didn't get to watch a ton of it on Saturday. It was on in the huge screen in front of me, but I was locked in on LSU and A and M, uh, obviously. So. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I think uh, I've got the Yankees. Now, who you got? Yeah, I got the Yankees as well, man. It's, that's a, it, it, it's funny, you know, the, the, the must-win thing. We always talk about that. They have to win. They have to win this game. I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it's a must-win, but not literally. They, ha they have to. Kelly Clarkson's lost a bunch of weight. Yeah, they. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know when the last uh, time I saw Kelly Clarkson was, but she weighed more than that. Obviously, yeah. There's no con there's no confirmations among anything, but I do know that a lot of celebrities have been on the uh, Ozempic on train. Let's say it happens, and uh, it tends to work out for them. Yeah, well, just don't eat. Good for Kelly.
Great stuff. All right, that's it for a Monday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. Uh, open the show 30 minutes talking about LSU and Texas A&M. And um, then the uh, next 15 minutes talking about the Saints getting smoked by the Chargers. Not a super fun first hour. We also um, talked about Lane Kiffin's displeasure with the SEC scheduling as Ole Miss will play in the day and LSU gets a night game against Alabama. Um, SEC picks against the spread as well as Denton Day. If you missed any of our show, you can catch it on demand for all your LSU. Hunt on LSU on YouTube for your Saints Hunt on Saints. Matt's going to drive you home next one after further review. We're back tomorrow, same time, same place on the Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show. Boudreaux's Electrical Services. Neil and Melissa have been running the shop down there at Boudreaux's Electrical for 40 years. They're a certified Generac generator dealer. They're a premier Generac generator dealer. That means they're in the top 3% nationwide. Every single generator that you purchase from Boudreaux's Electrical comes with a 7- to 10-year warranty, depending on which generator you choose. And they'll get you into the right one because we don't all have the same square footage. We're not all looking for the same um, same power when the electricity goes off. Some people want to run the whole house. Some people just want to run the essentials. Either way, they'll get you into the generator that you need, and it'll come with that 7- to 10-year warranty. All their generators are installed by a full-time Boudreaux's Electrical employee. Give them a call. Same number they've had for 40 years down there in Napoleonville, 985-397-1562, or new location here in Gonzales, 225-393-89. I give you the easy way, though, every single day, BoudreauxElectrical.com. Give my friends at Boudreaux's Electrical a call and give yourself the peace of mind. I know the power's not going to go out on you. It's BoudreauxElectrical.com.